All right, let's get started with English comedian and outspoken atheist Stephen Fry. Suppose what Oscar believed in as he died, in spite of your protestations, suppose it's all true, mm. and you walk up to the pearly gates and you are confronted by God. What will Stephen Fry say to him, her, or it? I will basically, what's known as the Odyssey, I think, I, I'll say bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I'd say. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac. Utter maniac. Yes, the world is very splendid, but it also has in it insects whose whole life cycle is to burrow into the eyes of children and make them blind. They eat outwards from the eyes. Why? Why did you do that to us? You could easily have made a, a creation in which that didn't exist. It is simply not acceptable. What kind of God is he? It's perfectly apparent that he is monstrous, utterly monstrous, and deserves no respect whatsoever. The moment you banish him, your life becomes simpler, purer, cleaner, more worth living, in my opinion. That sure is the longest answer to that question that I ever got in this entire series. Now, my work for the ensuing half hour and change is to convince you that everything you just heard from Mr. Fry is actually entirely correct. And as usual, we'll get there by way of the scriptures. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 10. Daniel, chapter 10. If you're new to the Bible or you have yet to memorize the order, feel free to consult the table of contents. That, that was my first joke, by the way, because you see, it's unrealistic to assume that many of you have memorized the order of the 66 books of the Bible, but I behaved as though that was a realistic expectation. Do you see why that's funny? Do, all, do you not remember how I joke? It's more of this. Just adjust to this and we'll be fine. You'll be all right. I've got a few more. You'll like the, you'll like the next two better than the first one. <laughs> All right, Daniel chapter 10. <laughs> when you get there, <clears throat> let's read beginning with the very first verse. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips. I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So pause for a moment. Here we have, obviously, a gentleman called Daniel, and he gets very serious news concerning a great war. So he responds very seriously with certain disciplines of abstinence and prayer. He's orienting himself toward God, and God actually responds. Skip all the way down to verse 10. It says, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my knees, on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Now pay close attention to what happens next, verse 12. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them, but... The prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now, the king of Persia and this character called Michael, in context, aren't actually princes in the human sense. They are spiritual beings with authority over geographic locations. Sometimes they're called territorial spirits. So in the story, Daniel, he prays, he gets bad news, he prays, he orients himself toward God, he asks God to intervene. And we later learn that God had responded immediately. He dispatched a spiritual being as an answer to Daniel's prayer, and yet... The response in question was delayed, not according to God's mysterious purposes, but because an opposing being in the spiritual realm is able to delay it. Now, consider for a moment the implications of this simple, short, strange little story. If one spiritual entity resisting another spiritual entity can delay an answer to prayer, does it logically follow that it could stifle a prayer altogether? 
And then the question has, becomes, uh, has this ever happened to me? And how can I know? If a spiritual being can do that, what else can they do? And what else have they done? For weeks now, you've been slowly working your way through what is, I'm sure for many of you, a challenging new way of understanding the world. For others, the, the paradigm isn't itself necessarily a, a new one, but actually living as though this paradigm were reality is obviously a different story. And think back for a moment, it's actually been quite the wild ride. You, you've talked about the primary antagonist of the Bible story, a creature called the devil, and this creature isn't alone. The universe, we've learned, is made up of two overlapping realities. You have the physical realm and the spiritual realm. And both realms are populated with real living beings with power to interact with and affect both dimensions of reality, for better or for worse. So that means that we as humans can interact with and affect the spiritual realm, meaning we can pray against demonic oppression and stuff happens. We can ask for God's help and stuff happens. And it works the other way as well. And because of that, we need to remember that spiritual entities have the ability to affect matter, meaning spiritual beings can interact with the physical realm. They are not entirely relegated to the invisible realm. And in the same way that there are human and spiritual beings on God's side, there are human and spiritual beings against God. And the spiritual beings against God are often called in the Scriptures the enemy. The enemy's primary objective is to murder and to destroy, as you've discussed in detail. His modus operandi is lies. So what I want to do now is take all this work that you've been doing, we've been doing the exact same work over at Van City, and I, w I want to carry it to its logical conclusion. And when we get there, we will be made to grapple with something quite serious. Are you guys ready to do a little bit of work? You all right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's rubbing his hands. Wow, eagerness. Okay, I like that. This guy. All right, bear with me. We're going to have to unpack a few complicated things, but hang in there. We're en route to something um, truly important, I think. And, and please listen, because... Though it's true that deceit is the go-to strategy of the enemy, it isn't the only thing he does, and it certainly isn't the only thing he can do. So turn to the right in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark chapter 9. I'm going to make you flip around just a little bit, so hang on to your Bibles. Not quite as bad as John Mark. Sometimes he makes you guys like flip all the way back and forth for like one line or something like that. I've got slides. You'll be fine. But you are going to have to turn back and forth. Hang in there. We're going to spend the next little stretch unpacking three broad categories. The first is sickness and death. The second is natural evil. And the third is something called chaos. And these also happen to be the, the very same talking points that I use at dinner parties, socialize, warm people up. <laughs> See, I told you you'd like the second one better. You did, huh? All right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm just, you know, it's hard to step into the, I was listening to you guys' podcast, and you've had like two weeks of Australians, actually, so the like humor is quite different. It's, <laughs> it's like, you know, the truly difficult part of riding on a kangaroo is like <laughs> getting into the pouch and getting all the way out to Outback Steakhouse, you know, like whatever. <laughs> I'm just trying to work my way up to an angry email or two, because um, I usually get one when I'm here. So if you have, <laughs> if you have an angry email... Address it to Bethany, and she'll forward it to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, we're, <laughs> we're back on track. Hang on. We're, we're building out these three paradigms, sickness and death, natural evil and chaos, so that we can construct something called a spiritual warfare theodicy. Now, a theodicy is an answer to the problem of evil. I'm sure you guys have heard about it. It's a big issue in philosophy and theology. If God's all good and he can do anything, he's all powerful, then why the heck is there still so much evil in the world? And how you answer that question is called a theodicy. All right, Mark chapter 9. You guys there? You all right? All right, let's begin with verse 14. <clears throat> When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet them. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd said, teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. 
You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me, which is awesome on Jesus' behalf. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, one of my favorite lines in all of the gospel stories, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him, never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. Okay, obviously, there's, there's quite a lot there. But for our purposes at the moment, let me pose a question. Was the boy in the story sick or oppressed by an evil spirit? Oh, okay. Wow, that, he's confident in his answer. Uh, the father in the story actually describes his son as being possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. But if you read the story, there's actually physical uh, consequences of it as well. So the malady is actually twofold. There is a physical ailment for sure, and there's demonic oppression, or in the language of this story, possession. Now, in the modern world, there's this tendency to simply read the, this prognosis as like a primitive one. So the boy was simply epileptic and mute, we tend to think, maybe even subconsciously. Ancient peoples tend to associate sicknesses and disorders with evil spirits, but now we know better. But the problem with that is that Jesus performs an exorcism, and it works. The boy had been mute, and he shrieks all of a sudden. Jesus doesn't simply do a healing work against epilepsy. He could have, I suppose. Instead, he speaks directly to a personified entity saying, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. He even calls it a uh, mute spirit. So is Jesus healing a mute boy or casting out a demon? And the answer is obviously that he's doing both concurrently. And the distinction between those two is not one that gets made by Jesus or the gospel authors. They want us to see that Jesus' work of healing and of casting out demons as irrevocably connected ideas. For Jesus, sickness and suffering are not imposed by God, they're not God's will at all, actually, but they are the work of someone the New Testament calls the devil or Hasatan, the Satan. Of course, this worldview is not unique to one gospel story. The authors of Scripture, again and again, the first disciples of Jesus, the earliest church fathers, believe the same thing that gets here articulated really well in Acts chapter 10. Here's what Jesus did. God, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing what? good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. For the authors of Scripture, Jesus' work in healing the sick is not at all dissimilar to his work of casting out demons. Look at just one more example from Luke's gospel. On a Sabbath day, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work. Come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? So this brings us to the very first important point in building a spiritual warfare theodicy, which is spiritual beings have the ability to afflict human beings with physical and mental illness. Now, this point 
presupposes the belief that just as human beings have been created with agency, meaning freedom to do what they want, spiritual beings have been given the same autonomy. And you could ask why. Couldn't God just uh, get what he wants by exercising unilateral control over creation? Well, sure, I suppose he could, but then there would be no relationship, there would be no collaboration, there would be no love. And God fervently desires all three things from Genesis to Revelation. That much is abundantly clear. Look at the way one little-known thinker called C.S. Lewis summarizes the idea. He says, this is a a two-slider, by the way, so prepare yourselves. God created things which had free will. That means creatures which, which can go wrong or right. Free will, though it makes evil possible, is the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A world of automata, of creatures that worked like machines, would hardly be worth creating. The happiness which God designs for his higher creatures is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united to him and to each other in an ecstasy of love and delight compared with which the most rapturous love between a man, a man and a woman on this earth is mere milk and water. And for that, they've got to be free. Of course, God knew what would happen if they used their freedom the wrong way. Apparently, he thought it worth the risk. If God thinks this state of war in the universe a price, wor- a price worth paying for free will, that is, for making a real world in which creatures can do real good or harm and something of real importance can happen instead of a toy world which only moves when he pulls the strings, then we may take it that it is worth paying. So you've got human beings with freedom and spiritual beings with freedom, and both of them are fully capable of good and of evil. If you remember the way uh, that uh, Tim Mackey put it in that video with John Mark and Tim Mackey, go back and watch it if you missed it. It's on the podcast as well. Um, He put it so well. He said the spiritual and physical realms, he called it the celestial and terrestrial realms, are two distinct realities, but they overlap. And the evil these spiritual entities inflict is not on human beings only. If you think back to Stephen Fry's critique of God that began this uh, teaching, he mentioned a parasitic worm, which if you want to look it up, it's called the Loa Loa worm. Have fun with that. And he uh, referenced it as a kind of evil that exists in nature. And why, he asked, uh, I would argue quite justifiably, why create such a thing that lives such a horrible life cycle? So turn to the right in your Bibles to a letter we call Romans chapter 8. If you're in Mark, that's just a few books to the right. Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. This is a letter drafted by a master apprentice of Jesus, and he has some uh, interesting insight into the condition the world is in. Romans 8, let's read beginning with verse 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Verse 19, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation... The whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So yes, there are creatures in the animal kingdom, parasites that feed off of other living things in grotesque and even detrimental ways. But honestly, Fry could have mentioned any number of horrors. If you've, if you've watched like an episode of Planet Earth, um, then you've seen a G-rated glimpse into the often cruel and unforgiving world of the animal kingdom. The ignumian wasp uh, is an insect that lays eggs in the body of a living host, which in turn devour the host alive before erupting out of its body. And while studying that particular wasp, Charles Darwin struggled with what had become his dwindling belief in God, and he wrote this in a letter. I am bewildered. I had no intention to write atheistically, but I own that I cannot see as plainly as others do, and as I wish to do, Evidence of design and beneficence on all sides of us. There seems to be too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the ignumian wasp with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars or that a cat should play with mice. What a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and horridly cruel works of nature." 
Many species of animals abandon or kill or even devour their own newborns for reasons scientists often don't understand. The animal kingdom is a violent, cruel world overflowing with abject suffering. And animals are only one aspect of what we call nature. There are also hurricanes and tornadoes and volcanoes and tsunamis and earthquakes. And some of those uh, we're to blame for because of human disruption. But uh, a lot of them, or all of them at least in some sense, existed long before us and exist without us. Why? The early church actually responded to this question with the understanding of two overlapping dimensions of reality. So maybe for some of you that sounds a bit strange, but the early church actually uniformly argued that spiritual beings like humans were created free and that they, like humans, are given influence and responsibility in the world. And we have to add to that what we've already learned from Jesus in John chapter 8, what's been kind of a landmark text for this series. You belong to your father, Jesus says to the religious leaders. The devil, you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And that language implies from the very, very, very beginning. Not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So point two in building a spiritual warfare theodicy. Spiritual beings have the ability to afflict the natural order, creation itself, with evil, suffering, and even death. And now that we have the first two building blocks in place, we can begin to make sense of the final piece, which is something called chaos. Now, in the conversation around finding balance in a supernatural worldview, there's often a frustratingly ambiguous gray area because we are, in theory, learning to become the type of people who take the supernatural realm very seriously, but without becoming the type of people who blame the devil for everything, from like a cough to a parking ticket or whatever. And that brings us to this idea of chaos. Now, there's a, bear with me for just a moment. There's a branch of mathematics called chaos theory. If you've seen Jurassic Park, you've heard about it. And it reveals that any complicated system can be massively affected by seemingly insignificant happenings along the way. So the slightest variation in a sufficiently complex process at one point can cause remarkable variations in that process at another point. It's sometimes called the butterfly effect. And the idea is that the flap of a butterfly's wings in one part of the globe can, under the right conditions, be the decisive variable that brings about a hurricane in another part of the globe several months later. I know that sounds like, what? why are we doing this? But hang on, here's why this matters. Our world, our lives, our souls, according to the scriptures, are in, in a sense broken. They are bent out of shape. They are bent away from what is true and good and toward that which destroys us. And the creation itself has paid a price as well. Wasps lay eggs in caterpillar larvae. Hurricanes destroy civilizations. The world is ravaged by evil, injustice, suffering, and death. Because both humans and angelic beings are created with freedom. And because that freedom is often used to do evil... Creation itself pays an ongoing price. But you know already from experience, from your own life story and the lives of people around you, that an act of evil, even a very simple one like a cutting word or a single fractured relationship or a lie that you tell in passing, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It has consequences. And that is true on a cosmic scale. Simple actions set in motion ripples in the waters of the universe, as it were, and those ripples intersect with other ripples. And now, because our world is broken and ravaged by evil, we are often victimized by that evil simply because of complicated patterns of chaos. And this is, brings me to what I think is a helpful idea. I would argue that there are actually two variations of demonic involvement in the world and in your life. There's direct and indirect demonic activity. So direct demonic activity is simple enough. You know, those exorcism stories of Jesus where he speaks directly to a personified entity and that kind of thing still happens in the world today, believe it or not. Other things like mass shootings with no motive and uh, horrifying child abuse, things that we look at and we go, oh my gosh, that is the devil. That's not, that's not right. Indirect demonic oppression is, I would argue, any and all kinds of evil that for all we know may not be personally energized and enabled by Satan or an evil spirit, but they are demonic even so, simply because evil itself is demonic. It originates in Satan and in his kingdom. 
And in both cases, whether it's direct or indirect demonic oppression, we as apprentices of Jesus are to follow in Jesus' example in recognizing evil for what it is and where it comes from. Greg Boyd says it well when he puts it like this. When one possesses a vital awareness that, is, that in between God and humanity there exists a vast society of spiritual beings who are quite like humans in possessing intelligence and free will, there is simply no difficulty in reconciling the reality of evil with the goodness of the supreme God. It virtually sidesteps the problem of evil. So consider this then. If our broken creation is inherently chaotic in the wake of autonomous wills and infinite variables and demonic influence and circumstances and natural evil, how does God intervene in all this? When you pray for protection, for example, or against evil forces, or when you pray for healing, or when you pray for someone you know to come to faith in Jesus, in what ways does God respond? Well, let me try to answer that question with a, a, a metaphor, if you guys will let me. So imagine that there's a small house situated in the midst of like a war-torn countryside. It's occupied by a powerful enemy, and things are, are not well and good. And the family that resides in that house is made up of the wife and the children and the grandchildren of some powerful head captain, currently away, wrapped up in war against this invading enemy. Now imagine in the house there's a small radio that communicates without fail to a device that this captain carries on his person while he is away at war. And let's say that the family radios to the captain to inform him that they've fallen victim to attack or that they need supplies or that they've been wounded or that one of them has become ill. The captain will always hear those requests and the family takes for granted that he cares deeply and tremendously for his family. Even so, he's part of a larger battle. Thousands of lives to consider, presumably some immediate skirmish going on at that moment. So sometimes the captain meets his family's request, sometimes immediately so. Sometimes it's a tad delayed, as was the story for Daniel and the angel that came to intervene. And the family, they lack the broad perspective of the captain. So what they do is they simply trust that the captain cares for him, for them. The captain wants to meet all their needs. That much is never in dispute. And he works to do so with every resource at his disposal at all times. But it isn't possible for the captain to intervene in every single way, even the way that he would like to. And then the question, it's a metaphor, so it breaks down, but God is obviously different than some human captain in a war-torn countryside. For one, God is all-powerful, yes. So how can something be impossible for God, as it were. But think about this for a moment. You know, we, we stand around and we all collectively sing a song together like, nothing is impossible for you or whatever. Or when we say things like, straight out of the scriptures, but for God, all things are possible. Even Jesus, Jesus just moments ago, um, everything is possible for the one who believes. But these are deep truth statements. They're not necessarily like metaphysical truth assertions, meaning... We all agree that God cannot sin. That's something that God can't do. Um, God can't be tempted, James says. God cannot violate the law of contradiction, so God can't make a round triangle or a married bachelor or something like that. And similarly, God cannot sovereignly decree that the cosmos is truly free, but also not free. If the cosmos is indeed free, then by definition, free agents are free to go this way or that way. And if God intervenes in such a way that he decrees that we can go this way only, then we are no longer free. So for God to respond to every single prayer in keeping with his heart, with what he truly wants for you, your life, and the world around you, he would have to, at times, revoke freedom. And as far as we can tell from the scriptures and from our own experience, he doesn't do that. Irrevocability is built into the very definition of free will. And this means that you and I are confronted with a life that is inherently chaotic, riddled with evil, and set before the inevitability of all kinds of suffering and ultimately death. At this point in my teaching, I'd like to point out that I also officiate weddings. <laughs> I was so ashamed of that joke. It's so cheap. But it, it kind of worked. Um, listen, the... Even so, even though we are set before a life that is filled with the inevitability of suffering, that doesn't mean that that's a realization without hope. 
One way of understanding the entire story of the Bible is that it is the story of an ongoing cosmic war. So if you liken that narrative to other real-life stories of war, at least uh, (laughs) real-life meaning ones that we know from history, our story goes, or one story goes, on June 6, in 1944, uh, the Allied forces stormed a beach in Normandy, France, and they defeated the German military there. And historians apparently generally agree that this was the decisive victory moment in the war because the battle ensured the victory of the Allied forces against Germany. Of course, it took another year or so of fighting before V-Day was actually declared and the war was officially over. Though the war had been won in principle in that single battle a full year before that, Again, this from Boyd. He says, In the same way, Christ in principle defeated the powers with the unsurpassable love he unleashed through his incarnation, life, ministry, death, and resurrection. D-Day has been fought and won, but we are still waiting for V-Day. In the meantime, there are many important battles to fight. Indeed, sometimes an enemy fights the hardest when they know their doom is certain. In our story, in the story of the scriptures and the story of our apprenticeship to Jesus, the hero has already rescued his love, the enemy has already been defeated, and on a coming day, all of the enemy's evil will be completely eradicated for good. And I would argue that one of the most essential aspects of understanding your fight against the devil is understanding what he does and understanding what God does And understanding that the two are never alike. In the words of Jesus himself, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Do you see that distinction? One brings death and the other brings life. Radically opposite poles. Meaning God's purpose for you is not death. Do you understand that? My heart honestly uh, breaks and my stomach turns when some vile thing happens in the brokenness of our world, a mass shooting or a hurricane that destroys entire cities, and I hear platitudes on the lips of well-meaning sympathizers when they go to phrases like, oh, well, you know, God's in control, and I think and say, God didn't do that. I heard someone stand before a congregation once and claim that though his father had physically abused him for years, God had planned that with a great purpose in mind for his future. And I thought, God did not do that. A broken man did that, and he was energized by the will of Satan, not God. At my own father's funeral, a pastor opened the the proceedings with a prayer, and he said, you know, God, you're sovereign over death. You give and you take away. And then I stepped behind the microphone moments later and said, God did not take my dad. The enemy did, but not for long. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, and this matters How can we go to battle with an enemy if we attribute his work to God's will, to God's control or God's mysterious purposes? How can we hope to understand God if we impose on him the murderous work of the evil one? Recently, I I was wrestling around with both of my kids. I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And, uh, and, you know, someone always gets injured in the ensuing scuffle. But you got to try it and see how long it can last. Um, (laughs) Minor injuries, they're fine so far. (laughs) And so I had my son, he's four, and I was like uh, throwing him on the couch or whatever you do. And my daughter, Isla, she's two, she was on this side of the couch. She just fell off the couch by herself. I wasn't anywhere near her or anything. And she just, you know, I guess she thought someone was going to catch her out. I have no idea. And then she got up, you know, I rushed to her to see if she was all right. And she stood up, she went, Dada pushed me. And I was like, what? I wasn't even close. I was way over here. But, you know, I didn't argue with her about it. I just said, I took her by her shoulders, you know, I was making sure she was okay and all that. And I was, I had to tell her, like, no, I did not. I would never, never push you. I would never hurt you on purpose. That's not me. That's not how I work. Even when we're playing, I would never push you off the couch and hurt you. And Okay. That was it, you know. It was, <laughs> they're, they're quick to forgive. Um, and I realized that, you know, it sounds like a, a silly sounding analogy, but as a dad... I felt this horrible pang at even my daughter's, you know, small little briefly held assumption that I would intentionally hurt her. 
So can you imagine how God the Father must feel to have the devil's work attributed to him? Following the, uh, the Japanese tsunami of 2011 in which nearly 20,000 men, women, and children were killed, many in an instant, there were, of course, pastors and thinkers who spoke up to attribute the tsunami and its effects to the work of God, God's control, and all that. And uh, theologian David Bentley Hart became so deeply troubled by this claim that he authored a small little book in response called The Doors of the Sea. It's this scathing indictment of the all-controlling God. And I want to read you guys a small quote. It's, it's strongly worded, to say the least, but I'm not reading it to ruffle feathers. I want us to consider something before we end tonight. So look at this uh, from Hart's book. He writes, If indeed there were a God whose true nature, whose justice and sovereignty were revealed in the death of a child, or the dereliction of a soul, or a predestined hell, then it would be no great transgression to think of him as a kind of malevolent, or contemptible demiurge, or lesser God, and to hate him, and to deny him worship, and to seek a better God than he. And here, this theologian is connecting with the gentleman that actually began our time together, Stephen Fry, because there is a being at work in the universe, one the scriptures actually do call a God, the God of this age, in fact. And this God's work, this lesser God's work, is indeed revealed in the death of a child. And it is indeed no great transgression to think of him as a kind of malevolent lesser God and to hate him and to deny him worship and to seek a better God than he. I began this teaching by claiming Mr. Fry was actually entirely correct. He was just talking about the wrong God. To the one responsible, I join him in solidarity, solidarity saying, bone cancer in children, how dare you? How dare you corrupt a world so that there is so much misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should we respect a capricious, mean-minded God who, who corrupts a world to make it so full of injustice and pain? This is not our God. This evil, lesser God, we denounce just as we denounce his work and the toll that it has taken on our world. No, Satan is likely not responsible for your particularly headache, I don't think, but all that is not good is either directly or indirectly connected to the evil one, and we will blame God for none of it. And when we are berated with stories of marriages undone by unfaithfulness and relationships broken by selfishness and deceit, or synagogue shootings in the news, or children abused and neglected and starving, or foster children waiting in an office terrified with now no home to go back to, we recognize that God is not the one in control over these things. The evil one is, but not for long. And together we join with our teacher, our master, our Lord Jesus in rebuking him, pushing back his parade of darkness and despair as we await a coming day when Jesus will crush the serpent's head once and for all and he will never steal nor kill nor destroy ever again. The liar comes to do these things, but Jesus comes to give life and life to the fullest. And we stand with him. So would you do that with me now? Would you just stand up? And I'm going to invite you guys into a time of listening prayer if you're up for it.